Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our Develop Your Migration Toolkit session. Uh, we know that this is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I know most of you guys um, you know, went out to the pub crawl and everything last night, and you have plans tonight to, for, for this evening. So we're not going to keep you up too long. And uh, I think what's most important for you to understand about the session as well is this is not a sales pitch. Uh, the first couple of minutes that we're going to talk is uh, we're going to run you through a, 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 a bit of our migration toolkit and all the partners and the software that we have that you can use. But we are technical guys, and we like to see it in practice. So what we did is we did build a demo, and we'll actually show you these tools in action. Um, so bear with us a little bit while we talk your ears off, and then uh, be with us when we have this exciting demo and actually show you how we can build an automated flow um, and go through what we have done with our migration toolkit. So the agenda is, let's talk about cloud migration and on a methodolog methodological level, <laughs> what is the approach that you should be taking, what types of tools you have to consider and the various stages that you need to go through for, for your migration, um, and then automating those migration activities. So my name is Mundus. I'm a partner <coughs> solutions architect focusing specifically on the migration competency within our partners. Um, I come from a big data background and DevOps. And Carmen is also my, is my counterpart. He's hosted out of New York. I'm hosted out of Seattle. And we're pretty much tasked with um, kind of discovering and emerging migration patterns with our customers and working with our partners to help them build tools for those patterns. Um, I'm going to give over to Carmen, and Carmen will take you guys on the next part of the journey. And we'll kind of be ad-libbing between each other. So if I do at some point interrupt him or at another point he interrupts me, uh, we're not rude. We're just, that's Good the type friend. of guys we are with each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, Carmen? All right, thank you for that. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Really appreciate it. Hope you're having a great conference. So like Manda said, we're, we're really going to touch on some of the tools at a very high level. Um, I think the real showcase here is the demo that we've built at the end. But what I really want to show you is how we actually have the tools and they fit into our methodology, right? So as you go through your migration journey, there's many different phases. And it's built upon the AWS cloud adoption framework. And what we want to show you is how the various different tools kind of fit in line with each aspect of the cloud adoption framework and how you can pick the right tool for your particular migration use case. Um, so the one thing to think about when you're thinking about a migration and think about the process and how it looks like, each migration has its real own set of challenges. And to, to be honest with you, they're, they're really kind of unique. So if you've taken a look at the AWS Cloud Adoption Framework, it really kind of helps you build that best practice to follow when you're going through your migration journey. It gives you a prescriptive process to follow in order to, to, to make your migration journey a lot easier. And it's broken down into five phases. And we, oops, sorry. And we, we like to break those phases down so you can actually kind of tackle it piece by piece. And the first part is, is where you basically, you look at your existing um, IT real estate. And this is where you're really going to sit there and you're going to look at your application portfolio and you're going to really kind of assess um, what's, what am I going to get out of a journey to the cloud? What am I going to actually, what kind of benefits am I going to gain? This is where you're really going to start to kind of build your team and you're going to have the leadership backing to actually do your migration. Right? The, next, the next phase is where you really start to start to execute the migration and this is where tools come into play and this is the planning and discovery phase. And this is where you're actually going to take a look at your IT real estate and you're going to find what do you actually have, right? So if you think about how people actually discover things inside of their data centers, a lot of times it's the old traditional methods of CMDBs and they're usually decentralized. And they're, sometimes they're not in the same format as you talk to different application owners. And a tool is really going to help you in that matter, right? So that's the second phase. The, the third and the fourth, fourth phase, excuse me, they kind, of, um, they kind of go together. And this is where we talk about building a factory, right? So if you're really following the framework and you're really starting to think about using tools and putting DevOps principles in play, you're going to see a lot of reusable patterns. So as you go through the journey and you go through the various different applications, you kind of start building this circular loop and you start seeing a lot of reusable patterns and in theory that actually lets you migrate at a 
greater scale, your velocity should increase. Um, tools really help you in that matter, obviously following all those DevOps principles that the CAF framework talks about. It's really gonna assist in that journey. And then the last phase where tools are also obviously gonna come into play is your operational phase. Um, and this is, this, this is by no means the end of your journey. This is really where you're gonna take your application and how it looked on-prem and you're gonna make it into the next generation system inside of AWS. This is where you're constantly gonna evolve the application. You're gonna use tools to make sure that not only are you running in a cost-efficient manner, but you're, you're basically making sure that that application is capable of scaling to meet the needs of your customers, right? <clears throat> so, when, when you think about tools and all the challenges you need to solve, right, there's a lot of different challenges out there, but the big ones are is data center migrations can potentially be just a handful of servers to thousands of servers to tens of, tens of thousands of servers. If you're talking about those large scale migrations, um, they, it, it ends up being sometimes a very, very long complex project that you, it's gonna require significant man hours. Um, figuring out all of those interdependencies, and I always like to use the analogy of trying to find out that, you know, this application is talking to this SaaS provider, and then you find out that it's actually talking to something under somebody's desk, right? A tool's gonna help you identify that, that interdependency, and it's gonna help you figure out what's going where. Um, the, the, the one thing I'd like to call out too is, and I, I feel pretty strongly about this, is how do you test your migration? Tools are gonna help you actually make sure that in your migration, when you actually execute it, that it's operating as it should be, right? If you think about when you t typically do some sort of migration or a software release, um, you don't want somebody manually verifying that this application is actually up and running. You want to build a test plan. You want to make sure that everything is running as expected, and, there, and you can build that into your migration framework, right? And make sure that what you migrate is actually working as expected. And then last but not least is the long server downtime at Cutover. It's something nobody wants to see. And if you put the effort up front to build the migration factory and put all of those test plans in place utilizing tools, you could potentially bring down that server downtime and that, that way your customers don't suffer and your business doesn't suffer. <clears throat> so what tools do you need to discover or to consider? So we, we thought about it in five different ways and we're gonna touch on each one at a very high level. And like Amanda said, I think the real, the meat in this is not necessarily these are the only tools for the job and these are the only categories. We wanted to highlight certain ones. And then at the end, I think it's more about the demo and how you can see these tools in action. <clears throat> um, so port portfolio discovery, right? So the, if you notice there, the key word is automate. You wanna make sure that that portfolio d discovery is automated. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to think about. And again, as I was saying, the traditional method of, of figuring out what's talking to what in your data center is almost always out of date. There's application dependencies. You need to make sure that you have the ability to gather all of the application and server metrics. You're gonna need that information when you actually move into the cloud, right? So just because you have a farm of servers in-house with X amount of horsepower, it doesn't directly convey over to what you're gonna deploy up in the AWS space. You want to make sure that you're actually right size for the cloud. So all of these tools are discovering what you have in your data center. It's also going to be able to highlight this is the utilization that you're currently running at. This is your run rate, and this is what's going to help you make your educated decision on what it's going to look like inside the AWS. <clears throat> so there's a couple more questions that I just wanted to talk about in, in terms of portfolio discovery. And if you think about it, a lot of these tools are agentless or agent-based, but the thing is you need to consider is like, how are you actually gonna deploy these agents if, if you have to do that, right? So you wanna make sure that you look for a tool that has the ability to do an automated installation. We highlighted that later on in the demo today because the one thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna go through you know, a data center and have to go deploy something to a thousand servers. It's just not realistic. So we wanted to make sure that's there, right? You wanna make sure that you have the security policies um, the, what happens if it's asking for root level access to go discover? You wanna make sure that you can actually deploy this tool, make sure that it has the ability to access the resources it needs and doesn't, it doesn't interfere with any security, uh, security compliance um, policies that you have in place. And then a couple more questions that you need to, to ask yourself. But again, I just wanna really talk about that, that estimated run cost of the target environment. That's something that you really need to look for when you're picking a tool. So anything that you pick, you have to make sure that it does have that, that application server level performance metric that you can use to, to, to make an educated decision on what your environment's gonna look like. 
Mm -hmm. So you may or may not have seen it, but the application discovery service was recently released by AWS, and we're gonna highlight this today. By no means is this the only one, um, and we're gonna showcase a couple others. But for those of you who don't know, the application discovery service really works in two ways. There, there's an agentless version for our VR, VMware customers, and there's an agent-based version. And what I like to tell people is if you're a VMware shop and you're really trying to get moving and you wanna figure out what your, your total real estate looks like in VMware, Take the agentless version, let it run and get a good idea of what your, what your total cost of ownership is as it stands. And then once you identify, because maybe it's a shared environment between like QA and production and things like that, once you identify which ones you want to target, you can then take the agent-based version, install that, and get those deep metrics that you're looking for to figure out what software is installed, what's talking to what, um, and, and you can start to formulate that plan as to how you're going to actually migrate to the cloud, right? Um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward setup, oops, sorry, <clears throat> in terms of how you're actually going to get this thing to install. Um, but basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna, you're gonna take it and you're gonna, you, you're gonna take a VM and you're actually gonna import it into your VMware environment. And then what's gonna happen is, is once you set up the connector between your VMware environment and your AWS environment, all of the servers in your VMware environment are actually gonna be showcased inside of the AWS console. You're gonna selectively pick which ones you wanna potentially target. And then from there, you set up a policy on how often you wanna actually take those, those instances and move them into the AWS space. But what it's doing is it's creating Amazon machine images under the covers for you on the schedule that you define. And the really great thing about that is that allows you to actually actually test how you're actually going to see that instance live and breathe inside of AWS. So if you think about if you think about bringing that server in and building automation around that, the great thing is is you have this running and it's periodically taking snaps of the instance as an Amazon machine image and you can launch cloud formation stacks to test what the final product's going to look like, right? You're not going to take that Amazon machine image and just launch it. You really want to think about the bigger picture and making making the holistic environment. Maybe it's an auto scale group. What are my what are my cloud Cloud watch metrics going to look like associated with it, things like that. And this provides the ability to do that. <clears throat> There's also a couple partner tools, and they're here this week, and I want to bring them up. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have what's called the AWS migration competency, and it's broken up into multiple categories. Um, for in, in terms of migration, and in this case, it's discovery and planning. So everything that I was just talking about in terms of discovery, trying to figure out what's talking to what, right-sizing, these tools provide that information, right? There's some great tools. They're here this week. The, the URL is right here below, but we wanted the, to bring these to your attention as well because there's some great tools, and we actually use them internally as well if, inside of our AWS ProServe de, uh, department. <clears throat> So you're gonna to think to yourself, you're like, okay, so what's next? So I have all of this discovered data. I think I have an idea on what I wanna do in terms of migration, but where do I go? And, and the one thing that we like to point out is, is there's really multiple ways to go. Um, if, you, if you've heard of the six R's of migration, um, it, you'll notice here that there's really no direct easy path, right? Each one has its own set of operational challenges once you get down to that validate phase. But the thing that you need to think about is as you're going through the journey, you might find a tool that's actually going to help you through those various phases, right? So again, certain ones, certain ones may seem a little bit quicker than others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you might not hit any other roadblocks that you know that, that a tool could potentially help you with. Yeah, I think that's very important in um, in this slide as well. Is that the path that you take on your migration process also kind of determines what tools you want to use during that workflow. Uh, if you're going to do something like a simple rehost or replatform, uh, you might look at block level moving from on-premise into AWS, and that's where some of you know, the tools that Carmen already spoke about comes in uh, to play as well. But if you're looking at uh, larger migration changes in refactoring, uh, those type of things, you might look at other platforms and other tools that could more effectively produce the environment that you want to run in in AWS uh, in right sizing or using functions like or features like Lambda, uh, RDS as managed services and those type of things. It's really important that this decision needs to be made before you start your migration process. Right. It's not a good idea to kind of go into this um, and then halfway through your migration process realizing you don't actually know whether you just want to go for a rehost, a replatform, a refactor, or, or something else. Um, I, I want to stress that because we, we really see with our customers a lot of times that they don't properly define their migration strategy before they actually invoke the workflow. Yep, that's a fair point. 
So one more thing on the six R's, and this is something that I always like to point out as well, right? The, the three things that you need to think about as you're going through your migration journey and where tools come into play is time, cost, and agility, right? You, you, you'll see there in that re-host or that lift and shift model, you're, you're gonna get into the, into the cloud in a relatively quick time, but that does not mean that you, you're not gonna have to solve some operational challenges. You're now gonna have to think about how did you bring that server in and how am I gonna make that thing scale? How am I gonna make that thing work in its new model, right? as opposed to the refactor, which is actually gonna take probably a significant amount of time to redo your application. Maybe you're gonna look at containerizing your application, or maybe you're gonna make it a, a microservice or whatever it may be, but the great thing about that is, is once you're inside of the AWS space, the agility, it, it's just endless. You can take advantage of all the great services that AWS, AWS has to offer, and your customers are gonna benefit from that as well. <clears throat> so, you're almost there, you've decided on which one of the potential R's you're going on. But the thing that it, we, we point out here is there's numerous tools that are gonna help you along the way depending on those R's, right? So you're gonna wanna start to think about as you're picking those tools, what your final product's gonna look like. And we like to talk about the landing zones inside of AWS, and this is what your VPC structure is gonna look like. And you have to ask yourself a lot of questions about that operational landing zone because it's gonna directly impact your migration, your migration strategy, and how those tools are gonna interact um, with that destination environment as you migrate into it, right? So you, need, you really need to understand things like hybrid connectivity. You need to think about how you're gonna monitor those applications. What are the security policies that are in place? All of those things. And the one thing that I always like to, to call out as well is what's my contingency plan, right? All the tools in the world can help you do that migration. You could have planned, but there's always that unknown that could potentially cause catastrophic failure. And you wanna make sure that that blast radius is very small and you have the ability to fail back as quickly as needed so your customers don't to, uh, it, uh, customers don't experience any uh, inadvertent side effects. So again, a couple other questions that you need to kind of look at, but the one thing that I wanna point out here is success criteria, right? And we're gonna showcase this in our demo when we get into the technical aspects. And testing is key here, right? If you build the test plans, whether it be something that you write yourself or via off-the-shelf solution, something like server spec or whatever it may be to actually validate that your application is working as expected, you're gonna be that much more confident about your migration. And, and tools are really only gonna help you define that success criteria and make sure that your migration succeeds. Um, I do like to tell people to make sure that they take one last baseline uh, performance analysis or of the source environment, because you're gonna wanna understand what it's gonna look like in the destination environment and do a comparison. It should at least meet it. You want the, obviously you want it to beat it, right? <clears throat> so we're gonna really quick talk about the server migration service. Um, the server migration service is pretty straightforward. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a relatively new thing from Amazon, and what, that, what it does is it basically, didn't we hit this slide already? I feel like we hit this slide already. Uh, no, we haven't. Yeah, so yeah, I was scrolling ADS, through. Yeah, you ADS, which is the same, right? ADS. So server migration service, again, is a relatively quick um, installation inside your environment, and what that does is it basically it takes the snapshots, as I was mentioning before, and it creates those omnis. But again, this is really where you're gonna wanna look at creating those launch configurations and testing your application before you actually launch that net new environment, right? Yeah, so the, the, the reason why Carmen kind of feels that we've already talked about this is that's kind of part of our methodology, right? We try and make uh, workflows as reproducible as, as possible, right? To make the way that you interface with the tools kind of repetitive so that it doesn't take a large learning curve for you to deploy and do kind of different tasks, right? So yes, the ADS service that, my, that, we, the, that we built kind of has the same flow as the, the migration service that we have, um, and that's by design. So a lot of the sim same similar um, kind of implementations and not features, but the way that you use the tool um, is, 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 is uniformly part of the migration process. And that talks a lot to being able to, to automate it um, and also to kind of make your whole migration process a little bit more agile and keep training time and those type of things for your SMEs that will be affecting them, the migration down as well. Yeah. Um, partner tools as well in the migration space, and we're actually gonna highlight one in particular because we used it in our demo and it's cloud and door, right? Not to say that the, these tools aren't better than the other, they're all inside of our migration competency. They've gone through strict testing actually to, to, to obtain the competency, but we figured it would be really useful if we're gonna do a demo, not just focus on AWS tools. We're gonna to show how a partner tool can use automation and facilitate a migration. Um, so again, they're here this week, you can chat with them. I think the Cloud and Door guys are actually gonna to come to the room um, to answer any questions if, at the end of this, but some, some really great technology there that's gonna help you move your migration from on-premises to AWS. 
And then we have the database migration service. Yeah, so database migration service is um, also one of the many tools we have in the toolbox that kind of makes the transition of data from on-premise into AWS quite a bit easier. Uh, it provides you with the uh, connectivity to um, specify source and destinations or source and target endpoints. Um, and we'll then launch a migration instance into your account. And you can define whether you want that to be deployed, um, in, uh, where you want that to be, to be deployed and what access and security level that has to be. And you can kind of go pretty granular in the type of transformation that you want to do in the database migration. So you could, for example, have a MySQL database as source on premise, but decide that you would like to maybe change the schema or change the way that it works and migrate that database into something like, for example, a Postgres or a Redshift uh, using some of the transformation tools that we have. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is we can also set up automatic replication to make sure that it keeps up to date to whatever changes that may have been made on the source and automatically replicate that through to the destination up to the point where you are ready to actually cut over and go with the new database, the migrated database and live. So you'll, you'll have that confidence to know that when I press this button, when I swift my, read my DNS over or whatever my, my cutover plan is, that the database would have the most recent information from my source database available as well. It's a really lightweight and a really easy workflow as well. Um, and while we, uh, at the moment we didn't have, <coughs> sorry, at the moment we don't have CloudFormation integration with DMS, but using some custom actions and some Lambda functions, we showcase how easy it is to automate the tasks right. using the API that's provided in DMS as well. Um, and, and that's, again, speaking to what we want to highlight today is that with a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of creativity, Difficult tasks and in legacy migration workflows can be automated, and it is possible to do all of that. Um, and essentially, you could have, you know, a Thanksgiving dinner or anything while the migration is taking place, um, and you don't have to worry. You can just come back and know that everything has been done for you. Yeah, that Thanksgiving dinner might have happened on our on our migration. It actually did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, partner tools as well for database migrations. Yeah, we have some partners uh, as well. Obviously, at Unity, um, pretty well known as well. And like Carmen said, none of these are specifically better than any of the others. Uh, they all had to go through a pretty rigorous test um, as well as a competency review for them to be a part of the competency. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, we work very closely with all our partners in all different um, uh, walks and different categories that we have to make sure that we have a bar and that everybody at least meets the bar and raises the bar constantly as well. That's correct. So, so last but not least in the terms of tools, and you can't talk about a tool without talking about Snowball. Everybody here is probably familiar with Snowball is, so I'm really only gonna touch about it, why you would wanna use it in the case of a migration. So you may have terabytes upon terabytes to petabytes of data, but one thing you really don't wanna do in the context of a migration, even if you have a really big network pipe, is to try and send that data up. It's gonna take a very long time. You might have to throttle that content, because if you don't, you might inadvertently break your production applications, and that's the last thing you want. So Snowball Snowball makes this easy, right? You go in, you order a snowball or a series of snowballs, they come into your environment, you configure what content you want to actually put onto the snowball, and as you send it over, it's obviously encrypted, which is great for all the customers that are really concerned about security. Once it's done, it goes to the AWS region, and it's uploaded in S3, and you can take advantage of it in any way, shape, or form at that point. The one thing that our customers are pretty happy about right now is now the S3 adapter for Snowball. So now, as, as, you, as you interact with Snowball, you can treat it just like an S3 endpoint inside of your own data center. Um, so a lot of customers who are already using S3 as a service now have the ability to just point at Snowball ball and treat it just like any other S3 endpoint as they're uploading their data. So the last, the last phase that I want to talk about really quick before we get into the demo is the operate and optimize phase. Again, I kind of touched on this before. This is where your application becomes a living, breathing thing. There's tons of tools out there that are going to make sure that your application is running at scale. But one thing that you need to think about is you want to make sure that you find problems anywhere inside of your application before your customer does. You don't want your application to break, and there's so many tools out there that are gonna proactively find those issues for you, right? Um, you think about it, and it, it's, it's really an iterative process. Just because you move that application over does not mean by any, main, that does not mean in any way, shape, or form that it's done. It's a living, breathing organism at that point, and you should treat it as such. Yeah. <clears throat> 
We have one last competency to highlight, and again, it's inside the profiling space. Um, and these tools are really gonna give you that fine granular detail as to what's happening inside your application. Because it's not necessarily what's happening inside of AWS. You might actually have hybrid con connectivity back, and you really need to think about, is it actually interacting correctly with maybe some of my on-premises resources? So you're gonna wanna do a deep dive into the application, and these tools are gonna help facilitate that. <clears throat> And then here, here's kind of the calf in a, <laughs> it's, it's sort of a column format, but here's the calf with all the tools in each and every section. Um, and again, you know, you can come back and reference this, but I think now that we've talked about the various different tools, it's really time to just kind of show how the demo utilizes them and why it's much more advantage, advantageous to put automation behind it. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically, just to give you guys a little bit of overview of the demo um, and what you're going to show today is the demo all in all when we ran it through um, takes about, what, 56 minutes, I think is what we said from start yeah. to finish. Uh, and we created a completely automated stack of it. Um, and it's, this is part of an ongoing blog post that's being written. So we'll share the code for this whole automation process with you guys uh, through, the, through the blog and you'll be able to actually go and do this in your own environment. Um, but for presentation's sake and to make it enjoyable and a little bit more entertaining, we obviously we broke some of those parts out. So you'll see us actually logging in and running some scripts manually. But the reason why we did that is, um, you know, automation is fantastic and we love it, but it's boring uh, for a presentation. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the kind of the backbone of this whole demo uh, is built on top of our cloud formation technology, uh, which starts out with our v main VPC stack um, or master stack, which has pretty much these sub stacks that we created inside of it. Uh, we start with launching a VPC stack that pretty much provisions our landing environment and everything that we want uh, the way that we want it. As Carmen said, it's important for you to have that. Um, we then launched our RDS stack, which is our database backend. We uh, have some source instances to, to you know, kind of uh, have a pseudo source location that we're moving from, uh, obviously. So we have our source instances that is going to be our source of the, the, the migration. Um, and then we have a DMS stack, which is the custom CloudFront uh, resources that we built. And the reason why we did this um, specifically is because DMS isn't available in the API, but we also wanted to showcase that you don't necessarily need to use this technology with only AWS technologies. You can use third-party applications that might not be available in CloudFormation and script and write custom code around it to might make it a part of the automation. Um, and to be honest, it was actually really easy easy to do. Um, and then we have our Cloud Endure stack that, that manages our migration, um, and all of this kind of gets launched out of uh, uh, the main um, master stack. Uh, yeah, so Carmen, do you want to quickly speak about yeah. the... Yeah, yeah, really quick. So for those who, of you that aren't familiar, we decided to kind of pick something that could be multi-tiered, right? So we decided, we were thinking about maybe we'd do the WordPress example, but that's kind of overplayed. We've seen that before. So Mandis came up with the idea, let's do GOGS, which is the lightweight Git service, right? So in our source environment, we have a GOGS application server and a GOGS database server running MySQL. So the first thing that we wanted to think about was like, okay, well, how are we gonna get the AD AWS ADS um, discovery <laughs> agent onto these instances, and how are we really Really going to drive the automation to actually send this discovered data up there and Ansible was it was pretty much like, like a no-brainer at that point for those of you that haven't seen Ansible Ansible is a really lightweight way of basically driving what they call playbooks to do a prescriptive um, deployment of, of your application to your instances so not only are we installing Ansible and we'll share the code you know I'm uh, installing the AWS discovery service via Ansible we're also installing cloud Endor, uh, via Ansible um, they have the ability to install that via a series of scripts. It's well documented and that's great. But again, you might have to install this on thousands and thousands of instances. So utilizing Ansible, you can actually drive these playbooks to your, to your host instances and install not only the discovery service, but also register it with Cloud Endor, yeah. right? So the, the, the reason why we, we stuck with Ansible or why we chose a tool like Ansible was because in the context of this demo, even though we're doing it on EC2 instances, um, the idea is that you might be doing this on you know, your on-premise fleet that has a a collection of different OSs and, and, and those type of things. Um, and we just wanted to show that it wouldn't be a lot of work or very high leverage that you need to apply to actually push through the code that you need onto your existing platform and existing infrastructure. Yeah, that's correct. 
And the other thing that we thought that would be really cool to showcase too is not do a one for one, right? So just because we have a database server doesn't necessarily mean that we needed to create EC2 instances behind it. So we thought it would be a really good time to showcase the database migration service and how it can write to an RDS instance. So we decided to put that into place too. So we've gone from the traditional, you know, you have your application stack talking to your database server. Now it's an application server in the cloud that's going to talk to an RDS instance instead. <clears throat> So final landing zone. Yeah. yeah, so this is the final landing zone. Uh, what it kind of looks like when it's all migrated is uh, you have an ELB in front of an auto scaling group with our source instance being replicated automatically uh, with RDS, which is a managed database service, obviously delivering the database endpoint for the service. So essentially we went from a very static, monolithic kind of application infrastructure with no HA, uh, no DR, and we uh, migrated all of that into a highly available, highly resilient environment. Um, and we also even added the little bit of a touch. We added a, a DNS endpoint uh, that's automatically update, uh, updated through CloudFront as well. So let's get the demo started. Um, as I said, it all starts off with the, with the power and the magic of CloudFormation. And here it simply is um, me kind of going in to launch the master stack. The master stack, as I showed in the very first picture, uh, then essentially built, breaks out and launches all of our um, descending stacks. We have quite a few parameters that we need to specify in the beginning of the stack, um, most of which can be uh, determined by getting values from the API that's available in AWS. Um, and then this is just our source environment that we kind of, uh, information that we teach the CloudFormation stack where it needs to go find the information. Uh, we also have to apply some additional IAM, IAM roles because we need to give CloudFormation the, the, the permissions to create its own roles and security policies for our migration when the migration is being done. Um, so yeah, we, we, as I said, we kind of recorded, it's about 56 minutes, we didn't have time for that, so we sped up quite a bit of the demo. Uh, so if it does jump up and down around every now and again, uh, please understand that's normal, it's expected. Uh, we are going at about four times the, the normal speed to fit everything in here. Um, so at the moment, CloudFormation is, is bringing up the VPC. There you can see the two, uh, the Cloud Endure stack that we, uh, that we have that's pretty much almost being completed, and the VPC stack coming up and creating its resources. Uh, you'll, I'm gonna click into the, re, the VPC stack now, and you'll see that the event's rolling out um, and giving us a, pretty much of a running play-by-play -play of what it is doing at the moment. So why don't we flip really quick back to the Cloud Indoor stack and just talk about the one aspect of it, and we can bring it into the, into the diagram. Yeah. <clears throat> So the one thing that's in that stack, we, we built basically, if you see in this, in this diagram, we built a testing pipeline that could be reused as you move through multiple applications. Cloud Endor has a really great in ability to actually invoke custom pro pro post-processing scripts, right? So if you think about that, the possibilities are endless. So as your instance migrates to the cloud, after it's finished and it spins up, it has the ability to invoke something, right? It could invoke, maybe it's a puppet manifest, maybe it's a shell script, maybe you're gonna rename the instance. But we thought about it, we're like, we could build a testing framework and have it invoke that, taint, that, that, that testing framework. So what it does is it actually runs through and it's actually gonna reconfigure that migrated instance to now point to the RDS instance. And it tests that that actually happened successfully. And if it happens, it goes and it fires a simple pass-fail message to uh, an SNS topic, which Lambda is basically watching. And what Lambda is doing is looking for all of the pass-fail messages that are potentially coming through. And for anything that's a pass, it's going to go create a custom AMI for you. Right? So if you think about that, you can now build a pipeline that's very, very repeatable across all of your applications utilizing Cloud Endora's custom post-processing scripts. Yeah, and this is important for us because we need to be able to, like Carmen said in his, in, while he was talking, to validate that the migration was a success, right? And that we, what actually landed up in the target process was what we expected to be there. Um, and it was, again, easy for us to just take all of that in, uh, infrastructure that, that's already there and provision it with AWS and have it available in our, um, in our target environment without needing to do a lot of work on it. 
Uh, and it's, it, we could deploy it simultaneously, and at um, uh, you know, this point, it's actually firing off asynchronously uh, to the rest of the migration process. And I think that's also one thing that we want to kind of highlight in, this, in, in our demo is we are only migrating one instance uh, or one very simple application, but the framework that we built here is capable of launching many applications of different types asynchronously in, in parallel with each other. Um, and all of the, it's, because it's focused or it's built on the back end of things like SQS and Lambda, um, it'll infinitely scale with the requirement of your load. So whether you're load, moving one application, 500 applications, or, or 10,000 applications, the, the availability will still be there and the capacity would still be there to do it. Okay. Um, so the VPC stack does take a while to look up. As all of you know, it takes a while to attach ENIs. It takes a while to create uh, the, the gateways. But what's important is all of our compliance and uh, business rules that we wanted in our target environment, the ACLs, the security groups, everything is being provisioned now. So we don't have to worry about that once the migration is taking place for the actual instances. And we, can, uh, re we reference those security groups, <coughs> those um, uh, ACLs, those NACLs, everything, uh, in the subsequent stacks. So it's a really important um, piece of the puzzle that's happening right now. I am gonna jump a little bit forward. I don't think we need to sit and wait for that. Um, there we go. Uh, so in about a second you'll see the, there we see the source instance resources. So the source instance resource, that uh, stack that just launched, that's our virtualized environment, our virtual source environment, and also our RDS stack that came up here. Um, so this is now launching the, the uh, GOG server as well as an, a secondary EC2 server that is um, where our My MySQL database sits. And then we launched the third instance that we said is our bastion host uh, from where we'll actually be executing the Ansible logs uh, or the Ansible playbooks and installing the agents that we need for the discovery as well as for the migration. Um, we can jump up a little bit more. So here you can see the instances actually becoming available. As, one, as part of the outputs in the CloudFormation uh, template, you'll see there the resources being created and the outputs will now show the DNS names that we can connect to for the source instances. I just jumped ahead of it, anyway. So I got from the outputs and I could, be, I could SSH into the instance. Part of the instance uh, process that we brought it up as we used user data to update our YUM repositories and the software on the instance. Um, this runs for a couple of seconds as well. And the nice thing about this is we, uh, later in our playbooks, well, the reason why we did this to update the YAM repositories on the first boot of the instance is later in the playbooks, uh, we would actually want to make sure that before we install certain software that the environment looks the way that we want. And we would do things like pip updates and YAM updates. Um, and this kind of just saves us a little bit of time. They are just added the SSH key for Ansible so that Ansible could actually connect to the other instances. And you'll similarly have these type of keys that you add to Ansible as well. Here we are um, running the database provision playbook which installs and prov uh, the database on our source instance um, and configures MySQL to be able uh, to uh, deliver requests to the GOGS instance as well as to the RDS migra or the DMS migration service later on. And here we're installing GOGS. Um, so the power that really the power that we want to show in, in Ansible at this point is the fact that pretty complex application stacks can be really easy, really easily be created and deployed and managed um, without too much in, um, investment in infrastructure or, or software development. So now you can see actually going to the GOG server. If I'm going to open the GOG server and if, if everything happened the way we hoped it happened, uh, we should now see the GOG's interface, and there we do. We just need to have that initial configuration to, allow, to give it the password for the database, which was provisioned uh, by Ansible. So I get the password that I set. And here we do our first login. So the f we're going to register a user, and this is one of the proofs that we're going to do to make sure that the database migration as well as the GOGS migration was successful. So if once the migration is finished and everything's sitting in, uh, in our target environment, then theoretically the user we created now on the source environment should be valid. Right? Is that a, everybody agrees that that's a valid test? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of our tests that we're going to to kind of just make sure that we're not just pulling wool over your guys' eyes. So RDS takes a, quite a while to to um, to create as well. And while RDS is, uh, is is running and while we're waiting for RDS to be created, um, 
we kind of set up the environment for the next phase. As I mentioned, these things that I'm doing now is actually also all, everything is automated. We just stopped the automation because it really doesn't make for great viewing if it's automated, right? Um, here you can see the DMS stack, com the DMS stacks coming up. So the, the DMS stacks are important because, as I said, it's a custom resource that we're building in CloudFormation around DMS. So here you can see the, cloud, the Lambda functions were created. They, create, they pulled the code out of S3 for the Lambda functions, and they're busy creating the DMS infrastructure. So here you can see the uh, replication instance that's required for the DMS to actually happen, or the DataMS migration to actually happen, has already launched. And for this to happen, we created some uh, migration endpoints. We also created some um, uh, uh, subnet groups that the instances could launch into. Right. Now, the, the actual replication instance is a fully managed instance that's being launched and takes a while. So we had to teach CloudFormation how to wait for this instance to become available before registering a task. Um, and this was all done through some event log or event watching that we set up in CloudWatch uh, and, and wait handlers that we used in CloudFormation. So CloudFormation would constantly pull this replication instance to wait for it to become ready and then cre uh, create the task. And as you can see, the task was created. It was successfully created. And here we can actually see the migration starting of the database. The database is now being migrated from the source instance that we, that we set up earlier um, into the target destination. And in a couple of seconds, this is a full load migration. So we're literally picking up the whole database and throwing it into our target. And you'll see the CloudFormation templates are also now reporting back to the API saying that they're completed. And here you can see that the creation and the migration is completed. So at this point in the time of the demo, we are effectively done with our DMS migration. We created custom resources. It, ought, it worked as, as we wanted it to work. And it has now migrated from our source database into our target database. Mm -hmm. Now the next phase is to provision the actual block level copy that we want to do. And what the, to do the block level copy to get the GOGS information, the actual GOGS software, into the target is what we're going to use Cloud Endure for. So Carmen created a Cloud Endure playbook. And the, what this playbook actually does is it goes and installs the Cloud Endure um, agent onto the source instances. It then registers itself with the Cloud Endure API and the Cloud Endure service. And then immediately, as soon as it has been um, been registered, it starts uh, making an image of that instance and, and doing the block copy um, for replication. And, and, the, and the cool thing to point out here with, with Cloud Endure is it's an ongoing replication, right? So after you get that source instance migrated into the AWS space, they have the ability to continuously take snapshots of your source instance and move it into your destination account. So you're getting that snapshot over time. So it's not just a one and done. You can actually get the change set if need be. Yeah, so just to prove that we're not lying about the whole automation thing and that we broke it up, you can see that's the actual migration toolbox playbook. If you run that playbook, everything happens automatically. We don't have to touch it at any point in time. So the, you can see that's just inc uh, including all the uh, playbooks that we ran separately and broke out for a little bit of a discussion. So now we're going into the Cloud India portal. We're logging in uh, to our, our account. And if everything on the installation was happening as we expected, we should see our instance in there, and we do. Our instance has been registered with Cloud Endure. They're aware of the instance. They are aware of where we want to take the instance, um, and the replication has now started on our behalf. Just some, some validation checking there for the demo's sake. You, that's the IP address of the source instance we just copied, uh, logged into a little bit earlier as well. So the, do you want to talk about the, the, the process that Cloud Endure is going through now and why yeah. we went to, to, to have some turkey and, um, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So basically what's happening here is, is, like I mentioned, it's registering itself with the Cloud Endure API. You're seeing your source server actually appear inside the Cloud Endure dashboard. And at this point, it's now starting to copy at a block level over into your destination environment. It's spinning up a brand new instance inside of AWS. It creates what they call a replicator inside your account as well. And over time, it's moving that instance. Once the instance is there, then it's going to start doing that chain shot and those snapshots. And the reason we walked away is that's something that we didn't really feel like we would have to monitor over time. We knew that we would come back when we came back, the latest and greatest information would be up in the AWS space. But 
But what we did was once we were ready to go, and this is, could be any sort of orchestration engine, we decided to make just a simple Python script that invokes the Cloud Indoor API. And the Cloud Indoor API, we're basically telling it, it's like, okay, it's time to migrate this server. We're ready to do it. Thanksgiving dinner is essentially over. And what Cloud Indoor is going to do is basically, it's, it's going to basically do that work that we were talking about where it's spinning up that test image of the latest of the latest snapshot, and it's going to fire that post-provisioning script where I was talking about the testing framework, where it's reconfiguring the GOGS instance to point to the database instance. The, the SNS topic receives the pass message after its test, it hits the Lambda function, Lambda snaps that AMI, and we subsequently put a message in queue because we thought about this. If you were working on this at scale, you could potentially have a lot of AMIs flying around. So we decided to put a lot of the instance metadata that's coming from that AMI into an SQS queue and have a polar. And so as we're polling for new messages to appear about the migrated instance, once that AMI's ready, um, we launch the destination environment. So we have a predefined cloud formation template for a highly available GOGS environment, like Manda said, with Route 53, <laughs> elastic load balancing, auto scaling, multi AZ. So you went from a singular instance in your source environment to this highly available, best practice recommended AWS you know, final version. Yeah, so just while we, uh, Carmen's been talking, what's happening now is that Cloud Engineer actually registered the new AMI from the block copy that they did. And, as I, and we're not joking, we really actually went to Thanksgiving dinner while all of this was happening. Um, and this is essentially where the, um, the queue has been announced and we're now v aware of the AMI that was created. But we're waiting for the AMI to actually be available so that we can launch an instance from that AMI. So here are our, cloud from our, our Lambda functions, the custom Lambda functions that we created um, uh, to, to basically do all this checking for us to make sure that you know, these things are triggered and the events actually happen as they are. And, and the thing to call out here as well is we made sure that as this thing is running and as these, as these cloud indoor tests are running, um, the, the SNS topic that's going to Lambda, it's, it's printing out all of the success and failure. So every server that goes through this function, it's actually going to say this is the server that passed. So if you think about putting error handling in there, you can bubble that information up and you could actually have it exposed inside your Lambda logs for further troubleshooting if something went wrong. Yeah, it's a full audit log as well. So you can literally see every application that was migrated, every server that was migrated, and the success and the state of that service. And at this point, um, it the we were told that the army is available and that we launched our target VPC stack, uh, which is a new, uh, a new cloud formation uh, uh, template that we're launching that has that high available um, uh, resources or high available architecture that we spoke about earlier. Obviously, we filled in those parameters based on the army values and those type of things that was returned to us through the, the cloud and your API. So uh, the stack was cre created uh, uh, successfully. The output provided us with the ELB C name, um, which we don't actually need because the ELB automatically was registered to our root 53 as an alias record, and it now points to our uh, migration domain that we set up for our target migration when it's finished. So in a few seconds, I should be able to access GOGS on the target server um, on the new server and auto scaled, in. yeah, auto scaled behind, behind an ELB. On the, behind an ELB, auto scaled. There you can see the two instances that was that's that's auto scaling behind the ELB. I should be able to log in through that domain and log in using the same username and password that I registered with on the uh, the source. So there you see we updated our DNS and I'm log I'm opening it up. There I see the GOGS interface. I sign in with user foo, and I think the password is bar one two three, and there we go. We're successfully logged into our new highly available and disaster recoverable environment, and it was all automated um, and, and a pretty simple process to, to, to really uh, get down to the core of it. Now, it seems like we had to do a lot of custom work in it, and yes, that's true. You know, you will probably have to put some grease onto your wheels, and you will have to um, interface with some of your teams to help you dev some creative solutions around problems that you face. But all in all, Carmen, I, don't, I might be lying here, but I don't think we spent more than maybe a week on everything, correct. right? That's yeah. correct. And the pipeline's reusable, right? That's the key yes, thing Yes, that's out. the key thing. Yeah. Yeah, the key thing is that the pipelines are reusable, as you said. And everything like this can, and parts of it can be taken out and can be reused in other teams that might have a similar but slightly different workflow. Um, and as the you know, TV show says, that's all she wrote. Um, and we now have the floor open for you guys if you have any questions.
But first, we want to um, just thank you, everybody, uh, for being here today. And please remember to complete your evaluations for the session and let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, because we obviously want to be better at, the, at this next year. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you.